You're listening to As Read By Me, the podcast where writers read and readers listen. Greetings, and welcome to As Read By Me, Season 3. I'm Dave Stiles, and this episode is called The Big Game. Sure, there's a big football game coming up in February, but life is an even bigger game. And in this episode, we'll explore both, starting with everybody's favorite bedtime storyteller, Rich Hosick. Rich is here to read a chapter from his newest book, Afterlife. It was released earlier this month, and although I haven't read it yet, the reviews on Amazon are excellent. Next, Barb Stakes takes us on a poetic journey through the seasons of life in her poem, Turn. And last but never least, Peter Waits brings us his take on modern Roman numeral usage at the big game and other assorted musings in his story entitled, Football. Ready? Set? Hut! Hello, this is Rich Hosek, and I have for you a chapter from my new book, Afterlife, A Rainy Day Investigation, a story about psychics, ghosts, and bank robbers, as read by me. Maureen Everly knew that she was dead. She no longer felt the passage of time like she used to. She didn't get tired or hungry or experience any of the physical needs that used to mark the hours of her day. Exactly how and when that had happened wasn't quite clear. Memory was a tricky thing. She knew her name, knew that she had lived in this house, and when she wandered from room to room, she could recall specific events that had happened in each of those places. Little by little, she had been collecting those memories and piecing back together her life. Marine looked out the windows, but never ventured outside. She had a fear that she only existed this way inside the house, and if she left it, she would lose her tenuous hold on this whatever it was. Was she a ghost? She had a sense that there was some purpose for her, some reason why she hadn't gone to heaven, or maybe hell. But what that reason was, she didn't know. Maureen couldn't help but smile as she watched Danny sitting at the small desk in his room, drawing intently. He had taken several sheets of paper, folded them in half, and was making a comic book. She tried to follow along with the story. Danny was into pirates, and this story featured a very unlucky one named Eric. He had two peg legs, two hooks for hands, and an eye patch. It took some time for her to realize the boy could see and hear her. It wasn't until he had turned to her one day and asked if she was a friend of his mom. She told him that she wasn't, that she used to live in the house and was happy to see a new family making it their home. So far, Danny was the only one who could see or hear Maureen. She had tried talking to the other members of the family, but none of them seemed to be aware of her in any way. When he wasn't there, time seemed to skip around. She would watch him go off to school, and then what seemed like the blink of an eye, he would be back, playing with his sister in the backyard until dinner time, and then diligently working on his homework and then his drawings until bedtime. Sometimes, if she focused, she could take in the house around her like she did when she was alive. She would watch a fly buzz around on a window pane, or the sunbeams light up dust motes as they floated across the room. Moving through the house was different. It was more of an act of will than a physical effort. She would imagine herself across the room, in the hallway, down the stairs, and then find herself in that very spot. For a long time before the foremans moved in, Maureen only remembered being in the room at the end of the hall. It had been her room when she was a child. Although her memories were fuzzy and incomplete, that was something she was certain of. She couldn't remember leaving that room until the day when Marcia and Greg started remodeling the house. She was grateful that they left her room mostly like it was, though the bed was much nicer than the ratty old twin mattress on a rickety frame, she remembered. It was around that time that she began exploring the rest of the house. The changes Marcia had made were very nice, and revealed a beautiful house under the layers of paint and wallpaper that had been added over the generations. But she remained fearful to go outside. One afternoon she was watching the children play under the large oak through the window of her old room. Danny was making an effort to climb the tree, but was unable to grab a hold of the lowest branches. He tried to scale up the rough bark of the trunk to get himself closer, and his fingers almost made it around the thick branch, but he came up short and fell to the ground, much to Daisy's amusement. A memory came to Maureen. She was in that tree. She fell. She looked up at the ceiling and a moment later found herself in the attic. Next to the attic window, she could see the foliage of the oak tree within arm's reach. Then she remembered something else. The attic had been cleaned. 
and it was now filled with Christmas decorations and other odds and ends. But the foreman's renovation efforts didn't extend to this space. Below the window there was a board missing, exposing a space between the studs. Maureen went to Danny's room, eagerly awaiting his return. The clock told her it would be time for dinner soon, and as if reading her thoughts, she heard Marcia call out to the children to come in and wash up. A few moments after that, Danny raced into his room. Hi, Maureen, he said when he saw his friend perched on his bed. Hi, Danny. Can you help me with something? she asked. I gotta get ready for dinner, he answered. It will only take a minute. Danny smiled. Okay. He was curious. Marie had often talked to him, telling him stories about her childhood, and she was a good listener. But she had never asked him to do anything for her before. Grab your chair and follow me into the hallway, Maureen said. Danny obediently picked up the wooden chair in front of his desk and carried it out of his room. Maureen was standing in the middle of the second-floor hallway below a rectangle in the ceiling that had a chain dangling down from it. Danny had asked his father about it. He told him it was the attic. Come here and stand on the chair. You should be able to reach the chain, Maureen told him. The boy placed the chair beneath the spot she indicated. The end of the chain was an inch too high, but Danny gave a little jump and managed to grab onto it. He pulled, and the door swung down, revealing a ladder tucked up inside. Move the chair, Maureen instructed. Danny did so. He inspected the ladder and saw that it unfolded like a grabber toy he had. He grasped the bottom step and pulled it back. It extended much more easily than he had expected. Are we going up there? he asked. Yes, don't be afraid. It's just like another room. I'm not afraid, Danny declared, then started trudging up the steps. There was enough light coming in for Danny to see the piles of boxes and old furniture. Over here, Maureen said from the window. Danny walked over and looked outside. Wow, I can see the whole yard from up here. Yes, it's beautiful, she said. Why did you need me to help you get up here? Can't you, like, walk through walls and ceilings? Danny asked. Kind of, Maureen answered. But what I need you to do is see if there's a box in that space under the window. Danny kneeled down and inspected the gap. I think I see something. He reached inside, oblivious to the cobwebs and dust, and pulled out a slender box. Maureen had another flash of memories, of her stuffing the box in the hole before crawling through the window and out onto the tree. What's inside? Danny asked. Why don't you open it and find out? Danny sat on the floor, placed the box in front of him, and lifted the lid. Daisy skipped into the kitchen and sat down at the table. Did you wash your hands? Marcia asked her. Daisy held up her freshly washed hands for her mom to see. Where's your brother? Greg asked. He went up in the ceiling, Daisy told him, as if it was something he did every day. Marcia and Greg exchanged a puzzled look. I'll go see what's going on, Greg offered. He wiped his hands on a dish towel and walked briskly toward the stairs. About halfway up, he caught sight of the extended attic steps. Then, as he got closer, he saw Danny's desk chair pushed off to the side. Danny, are you up there? There was no answer. Greg climbed the ladder to the attic. It only took a few steps for him to spy Danny at the far end of the narrow space, looking through photographs from an old, dusty box. What worried him more was that he appeared to be having a conversation with someone. Danny, what are you doing? He asked as he completed the ascent into the attic and crossed over to where his son was sitting. Hi, Dad, Danny said, smiling. I helped Maureen find her old pictures. Maureen? Marcia had told Greg about Danny's odd imaginary friend, but they had both written it off to his active imagination. Danny pointed to a photograph of a man and woman sitting on a porch that looked very much like the one in front of their own home. He tapped the face of the woman. That's her, he said. Greg sat down across from Danny and picked up the photo. He turned it over and saw written on the back, in casual script, Maureen and Dale, Summer, 99. He glanced down at the floor. There were a multitude of other photos spread out. Some were contemporaries of the one he held. Most of them were much older. Black and white snapshots mixed with a few faded Polaroids. Is this how Danny had come up with his imaginary friend? Had he found these photos and used them as an inspiration to bring her to life? He felt something cold over his shoulder, but when he looked, there was nothing there. Hi, I'm Barb Stakes, 
And this is my poem, Turn, as read by me. Roads on the travel of life go down into curves, searching for their ends, their destinies through journey. We catch the breeze by its string, holding on tight, constant at its tail, fly far before we know we have. The ride flicks up and down, to and fro, whips, sometimes smooth and steady. Day's warmth caresses us, the sun giving life to gentle grasses. We weather the swarm of weathers over time while it wears us. Rains change and reshape. Weaving creases, moving, molding different. We see us in the mirrors of public rooms, catching our glance in the face of a child. Smile we and wistful, it's someone else's turn. Hi, my name is Peter Waits. This is a story called Football, as read by me. All Major League Sports teams have a name, and the name is important. And the name is almost always something we understand or can identify with. For example, there's the Boston Red Sox, the Baltimore Orioles, the Chicago White Sox, the New England Patriots, and the New York Yankees. I'll get to the almost in a moment. In mentioning names, the original Cleveland Browns football team left Cleveland for Baltimore in 1995, but the team couldn't take their name with them. No, they had to leave the name there just in case another professional football team played there, and that happened. The new football team, also named the Browns, started playing there in 1999. From every perspective, football is confusing. Here are just a few examples. After 16 weeks and a few playoff games, we now know who's going to play in this year's Super Bowl, Super Bowl LVI. The two teams will be the Los Angeles Rams and the Cincinnati Bengals, and I'm already lost, and I'm sure I'm not alone. For starters, for most of us, Roman numerals are a problem. And equally as frustrating, I do not know what a Bengal is. And I'm sure almost no one else does either. So in case you are interested, I'm going to save you some time. I looked up LVI in Bengal, and this is what I learned. LVI is 56, and a Bengal is a domesticated hybrid cat created from an Egyptian Mao and an Asian leopard cat. That info was only helpful if you know what an Egyptian Mao and an Asian leopard cat are. Personally, I don't. And I am confident that if you took a survey in Cincinnati, you'd find out almost all Bengal fans don't know either one of them, too. I'm not finished. I don't understand why an American sport has its championship games numbered with Roman numerals that no one can read. As most astute historians will tell you, this numbering system was the real reason the Roman Empire eventually fell to the poorly educated, illiterate, warlike barbarians. What happened was... When the barbarians attacked the empire, the Roman commanding generals would send notes back to Rome, requesting more soldiers and more supplies. One just note was recently discovered. It said as follows, Under heavy attack, need double N, double C, L, triple X, Ivy men. We need double M, L, X, V, double I horses. We need triple M, Triple C, XV swords. We need bagels, lux, and cream cheese for everyone. And Flavia, since we're cut off from the village, we can also use some tzatzkalas for L, triple X, V, double I of the men. This is a priority item. Over and over, in battle after battle, by the time the bigwigs figured out exactly how many of each item the soldiers needed, the battles were lost 
and the empire was gone. And this confusing numbering system is not being used in a consistent, or for that matter, in an honest manner. If Roman numerals are going to be used to keep track of how many football balls have been played, then I think the scorekeepers and the odds makers and everyone else associated with football should also be required to use the same system. I want to see players' jerseys with numbers like XI or VIII on them. And scoring will be fun too. A field goal and a touchdown along with the extra point for the touchdown will be computed as follows. I plus VI plus I equals X. And as the game is being played, I can see the TV screen noting the ball is on the triple I line, and it's on the double I down with V triple I for the first down to go. As a further complication for me, I know I'm expected to understand the names of the players' positions and the rules of the game of football, but the truth is, I don't. Except for a few officials, I don't think anybody understands the intricacies of football. I mean, what are the positions of the players? Unless they are running out of time, these 350-pound behemoths start every play bending over, with one nervous and trusting player looking between his legs at the player standing dangerously close behind him. This makes me wonder. If shoe salesmen are reputed to be people who have a foot fetish, what kind of fetishes do football players have? I mean, if they're bent over with countless onlookers, what are they thinking about? And what are they doing when no one else is looking? The positions players call themselves are confusing, too. They're fullbacks, halfbacks, quarterbacks, running backs, sorebacks, tight ends, loose ends, dead ends, punters, kickers, wide receivers, narrow receivers, centers, left of centers, right of centers, nose tackles, left tackles, right tackles, fishing tackles, blockers, stalkers, and talkers. And who can really understand what most of these guys do? In reality, the quarterback is supposed to be the field general. He's supposed to call the play, but he ain't calling the play. He simply has the headset that hears the play being determined by a coach on the sidelines. Actually, the quarterback is just an order taker who knows how to accurately throw the football. Now that all that background has been given, here's what is planned by the team. The purpose of the plays is to penetrate the enemy's territory, and if enough penetration is made, it's called a score. The offensive team has IV tries to move the football X yards, and they attempt to do this by getting between the defenders. This all sounds very sexist to me, and I'm not the only one who thinks this. After extensive research, I can tell you many women don't like football for a variety of reasons. I, they don't feel a man needs IV tries to penetrate. Double I, they're upset if a man feels he has to punt after triple I on successful thrusts. Triple I, they're frustrated when a man is a few inches too short to score. IV, they're frustrated when X minutes of foreplay can abruptly end unsuccessfully. V, they don't feel a man should broadcast his victory or dance in the end zone when he does score. VI, they're upset when failure is caused by a fumble at the last minute. VII, they don't understand why any man wants to blow a whistle. Let the fun begin, and I hope the team you're rooting for wins. Well, that does it for this episode. In case you didn't figure it out, Peter originally penned his story last year, or in MMXXII. So hopefully the team names didn't throw you too much. And if you want to see how Rich Hosick's paranormal tale of bank robbery, ghosts, and stolen loot ends, you can find his book Afterlife on Amazon. Details are in the episode description, or you can always just head over to Amazon and search Rich Hosick to find Afterlife and all of Rich's other books. Thanks for joining us once again on As Read By Me. We hope to see you next time. And until then, enjoy the big game, everybody.